This is the border point between Scotland and England. Scotland is in that direction, and I'm going to proceed in that direction uh, to visit uh, Yvonne Ridley. Yvonne Ridley converted to Islam uh, a couple of decades ago, and uh, I want to hear from her how her journey to Islam started. Please join me. Sister Yvonne, uh, tell me how the, your journey to Islam started. Well, it started in the unlikely surroundings of a Taliban prison in Afghanistan. You were imprisoned? Yes, I was, um, I was held uh, for 11 days by the most evil, brutal regime in the world, according to George Bush and Tony Blair. It was a terrifying experience that I didn't think that I would survive. But throughout the ordeal, I was treated with a courtesy and respect that uh, I hadn't expected. Well, how did you end up there? Well, I had entered the country illegally without a passport and visa. Um, it was the build up to the war. And I wanted to see what life was like for ordinary Afghan people. And so um, I couldn't get a visa. They didn't want Westerners into the country. They were on the verge of war. So I sneaked in. I was determined to, to get in. And who, who were you working for at the time? I was the chief reporter of the Sunday Express newspaper in London. And... I just wanted to find out the, you know, what, what life was like for real, ordinary Afghan people. And then they caught you and held you? After two days, um, I was uh, rumbled as I headed back. Um, I was done for by a donkey <laughs> and, and uh, fell off this donkey and, and, and was um, arrested. Now, what intrigued you about uh, the Taliban? Um, I watched them for 11 days and I saw that their religion was more than just something that uh, was carried out on a Friday. It was part of their life. It was the way they ate, the way they slept the way they dressed, the way they acted, everything had an Islamic context. In fact, with the Taliban, it was quite clearly a way of life. And, um, and this made me very interested in how it worked. And about six days into um, my captivity, I was asked if I wanted to embrace Islam. They asked you? Yes, they invited me and uh, I just said that I couldn't make such a life-changing decision while I was in prison, but I said, if you let me go, I promise I will read your holy book and, and any supporting literature. And against all the odds, uh, they let me go a few days later while they still held on to other Westerners. I think uh, it could have been because I had acted like the prisoner from hell. I, <laughs> I didn't want um, to, well, I, I, I really genuinely thought that they would kill me. 
and uh, any act of kindness that they showed towards me, I saw that as a trick. Mm. Um, you didn't trust them. I didn't trust them. Uh, I rather foolishly uh, believed George Bush and Tony Blair. I mean, they wouldn't lie, would they? So, <laughs> uh, so I railed against my captors. I spat at them. I swore at them. I threw things at them. I just wanted to accelerate my demise because I didn't want um, this ordeal to go on for years to be tortured or abused. And their response to my very bad behaviour um, was surprise. And they kept saying, why are you acting like this? You were our guest. And I'm thinking, why are they acting like this? They're supposed to be <laughs> brutal and evil. But as I say, it, it, while they held on to other Westerners, they did release me on humanitarian grounds. And when I returned to London, I thought I, I made a promise and um, I'll keep my word. But I also needed to know about Islam because I was interested in matters uh, connected with the Middle East and Asia. And I realised just by simple observation of the Taliban that Islam was not something that you picked up and put down again. It was a way of life. Mm. And I thought, how can I write with any authority or understanding of the Muslim world unless I know more about this faith? Prior to your uh, experience with the Taliban, did you have any exposure uh, um about Islam, did you meet Muslims before? I mean, did you, what, what sort of knowledge did you have about Islam? Um, what I knew about Islam, you could probably write on the back of a postage stamp. And, and all of that was wrong anyway. And I, I began to think about this. I mean, I was brought up in the northeast of England in a white working class community. Uh, nothing as exotic as Islam crossed my horizon at all. So I thought, well, where have I picked up this idea that Islam is violent, brutalizes and oppresses women? And I could trace it back to television, to cartoons, to this slow, subliminal drip, drip, drip narrative that um, anything from the East uh, is violent, aggressive and oppressive. And I began to realise that um, I hadn't picked up a book about Islam or the Muslim world, but I had been uh, subliminally brainwashed to think that this is an area that is, is violent and oppressive. So after you came back from Afghanistan, you started fulfilling the promise you made. Mm -hmm. uh, you started reading books about Islam or started reading the Quran or what? I began reading the Quran and I was given a, an English translation by A. Yasaf Ali, which also had um, additional footnotes mm -hmm. and it had an index in the back. So being a lifelong promoter of women's rights, I went straight to the back to find the chapter on how to abuse women, how to prevent education, how to force marriage. Of course, I couldn't find anything. Um, and, and so I started reading it and was just amazed on so many different levels because um, the Quran uh, makes it crystal clear that women are equal in spirituality, worth and education. And it is totally gender balanced. It was incredible uh, reading it. So I then began reading supporting literature on women's rights in Islam and uh, even something like the marriage ceremony uh, that, that uh, I, I was told is called the nikah. Um, women can write out 
their contract. It's treated like a business arrangement. You write out your hopes, fears, expectations. And I'm thinking, well, this is like the prenuptial agreement that all the Hollywood stars um, (laughs) have drawn up. Uh, So many different things. And I, I was just totally amazed. So this drew me in closer. And what started out as a fulfillment of a promise, an academic exercise, very soon turned into a spiritual journey. I already had a core belief in God. I was a practicing Christian. I went to church maybe twice a month, which in secular Britain is bordering on fanaticism. Um, So I had that belief in God. And reading the Quran was so easy because All of the prophets, all of uh, the messengers, uh, they were all in there with the exception of uh, Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him. And I started then reading about uh, the prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he was an amazing character, uh, uh, the most perfect human that's probably ever walked the earth Mm. and just an amazing role model for people to follow. And then I started to begin to understand why Muslims held him in such reverence and why they got angry and upset if um, he was ridiculed or his image was portrayed and and so I started reading more about um, about him as well. And uh, so that was really a process. How long did it take? Uh, about two years. Mm. And I just thought that um, I'm still believing in the same God, but this is making just a little more sense than Christianity. And I spoke to various scholars and theologians from the Christian faith as I was moving over and spoke to a lot of Islamic scholars because of my profile through the Taliban experience. um, Everybody was willing to help me. So I had access to some of the finest minds in the Islamic world. But the final realization actually came through speaking to an ordinary brother when he said, why aren't you, why haven't you converted yet? You know, you're so close. And I said, well, I'm still stuck on the Holy Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Ghost. And he said, look, Um, what relation was John the Baptist to Jesus? And I said, well, they were cousins. And he said, so when John the Baptist prays to God, he would say, Uncle God. And I said, no, (laughs) I said, that's ridiculous. He said, exactly. He said, and that that is how ridiculous the, 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 the Trinity is because you cannot mix human with God. Mm. And and he said, you know, that that, that very that's basic, very basic, so basic, so easy to to understand. And I thought about it more. And um, and then another friend who uh, was a Christian, uh, I was having this discussion with him and his friend who was an atheist chipped in and he said, look, if you have three messages, three post-its stuck on your computer, um, Judaism, Christianity and Islam, which post-it are you going to take notice of? And I said, well, the most recent, he said, well, that's Islam. And he said, you know, I don't know why you're agonizing over this. <laughs> and, and He solved it, the problem for you. Yes. Mm. And it, it's uh, sometimes the answers to life are so simple. Mm. They're staring us in the face. 
And so I then um, took my Shahada. That was uh, on June the 30th, 2003. And um, the next day I was moving to Qatar to work for Al Jazeera. And I, um, I arrived in Qatar as a Muslim. And it was just around the time, uh, you know, Ramadan was a few months away. And I was so... So that was to be your first Ramadan? That was, that was where I had my mm. first Ramadan. And I was so blessed and lucky to be in a Muslim country <laughs> that um, isn't afraid to... Um, to wear its faith on its sleeve, you know, it, it, uh, it was So the wonderful. fact that you moved to an Arab country made it probably easy for you in the post-conversion era? Because you, yes. you were well known, I mean, you were mm -hmm. in the media, people knew you, mm -hmm. so probably your conversion would have caused a stir, wouldn't it? Yes, um, so it, it was so much easier um, going to um to live and work in a in a muslim country and learn more about the faith which as i say is is a way of life it's not just something that you put on on friday prayers and then forget about for the next seven days any backlash from uh, your old friends or your old colleagues uh, yes, I mean, some old friends and old colleagues are no longer old friends, you know, they um, they have just uh, not answered my calls or ignored emails, or if they see me, they look the other way. Um, but essentially, um, I'm still the same person, still have the same sense of humour, and the friends who've um, stayed with me, uh, you know, uh, have total respect um, for the faith. How about the Muslim community in, in the UK? Uh, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Um, people of, of, um, of all cultures and backgrounds have really welcomed me into the Muslim community, especially the women. And, you know, that this is something that um, I often talk about when I'm addressing uh, w women's groups. I'll say, before I was a Muslim, I would have walked into this room and seen those of you wearing the hijabs and thinking, oh, you poor oppressed women. And I said, now I walk into a room full of Muslim women and I'm trying to work out who's the engineer, who's the doctor, who's the psychologist, who's got this profession, who's the backbone of the community. And I said, and you're all mothers and so proud to be a mother, whereas the st status of being a mother in the non-Muslim uh, community is quite different. Now, how about uh, the community of uh, Muslim converts? Uh, because I, I hear from some of them that a while after conversion, they feel lonely. To what degree is that uh, loneliness? It, uh, it, ca it can be a lonely existence. But it's, um, it's something that I, I really... I'm, I'm not en entirely convinced about because I used to hate my own company before I converted to Islam. You know, I was forever at the centre of the parties and, and uh, always surrounded by people and, and always um, out. And, and But once I converted to Islam, um, I developed a peace that I hadn't known before and I actually now um, enjoy my own company and enjoy sitting down and reading but I can understand the loneliness because 
when you convert and and the community embraces you, you are, you know you do become the center of attention, and everybody loves you, and 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 everybody wants you to to do so well, and and um, and then life kicks in, and and uh, people get involved with their own problems, and because converts aren't part of a big family and quite often abandoned by their own family, mm. uh, they can often feel isolated. And so I, I can see how it could be tough. Um, it wasn't for me. It, it, for me, it was, um, as I say, I, uh, I actually started to learn to like myself and to have self-respect and self-esteem. Uh, which is very important, and I realised um, before that that I didn't have that self-esteem. Any challenges on the professional level? I mean, you you were working in the mainstream media before, but now that you've uh, chosen this uh, journey, things are, are are not the same, are they? No, I was uh, dropped like a hot brick. Um, the BBC. Uh, referred to me when I put on a hijab. The BBC referred to me as the former journalist Yvonne Ridley, and I. As if you are no longer. <laughs> yeah, I. I. It, it took many letters and and various complaints to different departments uh, to say I am still working as a journalist. How dare you call me the former journalist? And uh, it it. Um, it had been quite difficult, but people are slowly coming around to um, to seeing that I'm still professional. I still care about journalism, and and uh, it's I, I've changed the style of journalism that I do. I used to do a lot of undercover work, but now I focus mainly on humanitarian um, efforts and uh, I, I still go out into war and conflict zones and um, you told me before we uh, earlier that uh, you've just been to Idlib yes yes that was um, that was quite a tough experience um, People there are, you know, this expression, uh, hang on to the rope or hold on, tight onto the rope um, of Allah. Uh, the people there, they have nothing left but God. And it is their faith which is keeping them going. And... To secularists and atheists, you know, I would say if you don't understand belief, go to Idlib and you will see God in, is, is everywhere because that is what is keeping those people going. Now, in addition to your um, uh, conversion to Islam, you opposed the war in Iraq and you stood by the Palestinian people. And these two issues were also sources of uh, uh, trouble. Well, I have been a staunch supporter of the Palestinians since I was 13, 14, when I first signed a petition, when I first heard about the Palestinians. And I've always been quite vocal about support for the Palestinians and nobody really took any notice and then the moment I put on a hijab oh my word she's an <laughs> extremist and and uh, I said but hold on I had these views before it's not me that's changed it's you that's changed towards me and the um, the plight of the Palestinians it doesn't matter whether you're a person of faith or no faith. This is one of the biggest, uh, longest running injustices in the world today. 
and it uh, blighted the 20th century and it, it's running into the 21st century and it, it is a real big stain um, from east to west on our civilization and you know people talk about the siege of Gaza being 12 years I was on the very first boat to break the siege of Gaza and about 100,000 Palestinians turned out to see the boats arrive. Why did so many people turn out? Because there hadn't been a boat arriving in mm -hmm. Gaza for more than 40 years. This was incredible. And... Um, you know, uh, the boats, uh, there were two boats, um, largely crewed uh, by non-Muslims, um, a lot of secularists and, and atheists. And at one point during the dead of night, um, we were told that we were surrounded by Israeli gunboats. And we thought, you know, this is the end. Um, our communications were down, um, all the cell phones, mobile phones, everything was down. Um, it, we were in the pitch black, bobbling around in the eastern Mediterranean. And um, I was with filmmaker Aki Nawaz, who is a practicing Muslim. And I said, um, it, it looks as though this is the, <laughs> the end. The end. <laughs> and I said, do you think that um, we'll end up in paradise if we, uh, if we die here. And he said, well, yes, he said, I, I can't think of a more noble cause than dying for the Palestinians. And I said, you know, I said, you're right. And we both started laughing and, at, at the irony that we were going to be sent to paradise by the Israelis. <laughs> You know, and, and so we were laughing and saying, well, bring it on. And that um, belief in God just uh, made us feel so strong. And it does miracles. It, it really, uh, we, everybody else was, you know, you could see the fear and they're looking at us thinking, what are those two daft Muslims laughing about? <laughs> And it was because we were expecting any minute that um, that would be the end of, of this life, but greater things to come. Did you end up with a Palestinian passport? I did. <laughs> I did. I, um, well, for, for, so it, it was a miracle. For some reason, the Israeli boats just disappeared and we were able to continue on our journey. We got into Gaza. And uh, and there were these banners with our faces um, everywhere. And I just thought, they didn't think we were going to get through. Yeah. These aren't the banners of welcome. These are, these are the martyrs. <laughs> and so I think a lot of people thought that we were going to be... Uh... <laughs> if I remember correctly, nobody ever made it after you. I think all the other boats were turned down, or um, turned back, and or, or were uh, arrested. Uh, I think a couple did get through after that, but then there were the there was the the Marvi Marmara and the flotilla uh, crimes, and and it, it was um, yes, uh, nobody has been able to get through since. And it was, um, it, it, well, it, that is probably one of the highlights of my life. And if ever my faith and belief in God was tested, um, and I think I passed 100% <laughs> was that moment mm. on the boat. Um, but after that, uh, we met Ismail Hanea. Uh, who was then the Prime Minister of, in Gaza, and he issued us with passports. And I remember saying, at last, I have a Prime Minister of whom I can be proud. 
and and that was a a, a great moment as well. well and, a very uh, good note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, sister.